huge country, and in one month, we could only see 14 widely scattered areas of China. First Guilin in the tropical south, then Kunming in the foothills of the Himalayas, and finally Chengdu and Lashan to the north. A long overnight flight from Kunming brought us to a very misty Chengdu as seen from a hotel window next morning. We are now driving out of Chengdu, headed towards the south, about 80 kilometres away, to Lashan. The street scene along the way is really something. All the vendors selling fresh fruit here, and the shops in the background having morning tea or breakfast or whatever. All sorts of things for sale, crowded, really something. This is hard work, holding bridge girders. A bicycle repair shop. All sorts of service industries. Lots of bamboo for scaffolding, coal. And quite elegant on their bicycles. The countryside where there are crops everywhere, every bit of fertile ground is properly used. A radio shop, and under an archway showing the entry to another village where there were more shops selling all sorts of things. Here we are in a crowded local village centre. Cauliflowers and cabbages stacked high on the bicycle. And the usual traffic jam one encounters in China. It doesn't take much to cause it, but quite a lot to unravel it. Without a horn, I don't think these vehicles would function at all. But we're on our way again, I think. This drive south to Lashan is probably a microcosm of travelling on the roads in China. Exciting. The crowds are really tremendous. They seem to work it out somehow. 
the right of way is a bit hard to figure out. I guess mostly it's might is right. But somehow the bicycles seem to get a pretty fair deal from the drivers of the vehicles on these crowded roads. Another confrontation between big vehicles. The bicycles sort of seem to keep on getting through. Yes, look at that. One wonders how hygiene can be maintained under these conditions. And I guess probably it isn't. It's the countryside again where we're seeing crops of rice growing along the roadway. Dukes of straw. Another marketing centre in a little village as we go through it. Quite a busy market centre as the crowd gather to do their trading. Over a bridge, factories along the river bank, high-rise housing and crowded shopping areas. More villages, more shopping. Another river. Typical misty morning in this part of the country. This is the province of Sichuan. Chengdu being the capital. Sichuan is a very prosperous and fertile province lying in the central middle part of China beneath high mountain ranges to the west and this humid overcast weather is fairly typical of a very fertile countryside lots of rain hot enough to grow crops quite well but the prevailing factor is the heavy rainfall and good fertile lowest type soil, well watered. We're now in the more rural part of the province, heading south towards Lashan. There is rice being dried on the roadside on rolled core matting. Whenever there is a chance to find a warmer, drier part of the countryside, the people take advantage of that to try and dry out their rice. There's rice being threshed by hand and the crops are being brought in at the end of the present growing season 
in some parts they get three crops of rice a year. We're now heading towards the autumn, so I guess the, uh, this would be the summer harvest being brought in. road it's hard to make good time and we stop here for comfort stop. It is at a school and as one of our party said the latrine left a little bit to be desired. It uh, smelt a bit as though three dead wombats had just been dragged through. Descriptive but really correct but the children were delightful. Just look at it. One child per family. They're really adored. And they show it. But away again, through another crowded village centre. An old bridge across the river. Now abandoned, but truly colourful. And once again, superb scenes of life in China as we go through the village. Industry and the rural scene all mixed up, coexisting quite effectively by the look of it. In such a crowded country they have to. More rice paddies. And we just stopped at a tea plantation on the hillside. And here's an old woman with a child coming down the hillside. And looking carefully for traffic before she crosses the road and just a little bit interested in the fact that we are here while behind the tea picking goes on on the hillside but she's about to cross over there she goes avoiding the oncoming traffic while our tour group look at the people harvesting tea on the hillside on the other side of the road, she gradually makes her way towards what I guess is her farmer husband on the hillside. As the camera swings back, it finds her winning her way down the track and making her way up the hillside to where the farmer waits. This must be the classic old scene of China, despite the background noise of traffic. waiting for her. And the tea picking goes on.
quite a character back at the boat. He didn't want the card that we handed him, he knew what that was. Again, through the rice paddy areas with the occasional dam to ensure plentiful water supply because we're now rising into more hilly country. The road is under repair as you can see in this picture and we wend our way through what is basically a bypass I think while the road work proceeds. More hilly than it was previously and we climb up the hill on the road bypass behind a heavily laden truck of rice. Rice stooks along the roadside and some rice growing on rolled up core matting in places. As we wait for a go ahead from the earth mathing equipment doing the road work, Again, more stooks of hay on the roadside and the occasional rice growing as we go through the villages. carry a big load on some of these bicycles. Without them I think China would just about stop. We're now making better time along the road because although narrow it's a little less crowded. More rice drying, ducks. We only make it to Lushan, 180 kilometres south of Chengdu. A quick lunch in our hotel. And this time it's a Lashan beer. Each city had its own beer, all excellent, all German lager style brewed, coming from the old days when the Germans set up these excellent breweries in China. How do you enjoy that one? Then, onto our boat for a truly memorable trip upriver to see the giant Buddha of Lashan, the world's largest Buddha. Leaving the river bank of the Shan, we move into the swiftly flowing stream where in time gone by fishing was the chief way of life and many fishermen perished in the treacherous rapids where the two rivers joined. So to appease the god of the river a huge bladder was constructed, the largest in the world, and there it is. The rock from the construction of the Buddha was thrown into the big hole at the foot of the bank, which was a major cause of the whirlpool which trapped the fishermen's boats. And of course, once the hole was filled, the whirlpool was less severe, and of course, this was claimed to be the work of the Buddha. Each side a smaller Buddha or God stands guard on the giant Buddha. The foot at the base of the giant Buddha is so huge that it is said a hundred people can stand on it comfortably. Later on when we go to the top of the bank and see the Buddha from above 
you will see this happening, but first, let's have a look at the river. It certainly is flowing swiftly, and along its foggy banks, there is all sorts of traffic. This appears to be a tourist group in a smaller boat, and here I think is a power plant, possibly associated with a paper mill, and on the banks, the inevitable fisherman throwing his nets. And another one afloat. Testing his nets. And there are some nets drying on a little island in the river as the fishermen get ready to go out and do some more fishing. Here comes a load of timber on a raft propelled by a tug on its way down the river. And the little steamboat crossing over. I think this is probably a ferry, but as we approach the, the high bank again, we see some interesting structures on the bank and as we get closer to Big Buddha, we again see the carvings and the astonishing work that went into the 90 years of work in creating the world's biggest Buddha. There's the hundred people on the foot on the right hand side of the screen and looking up to its head we can see just how huge the carving is. Just look at those people on the foot. The swift flowing nature of the river can be well seen here as we now head back away from Big Buddha to the bridge which crosses the river, which we will shortly cross and we now head back towards the shore To board the crowds to trip out to see Big Buddha, they have floating holding pens, I guess you could call them, waiting for the next vessel to board. These are shrimps at a shrimp vendor nearby the wharf where we board our coach to head across river to see the Buddha from above. Uh, it was built in 700 and the first build is 713 to 803. So all together, the big Buddha taking 90, yeah. light years, yeah. light years. And now it's uh, over uh, 1,000 and uh, maybe 200, uh, 200 years old. Uh, this is a big swan in China and also in the world. Uh, you see, the big Buddha covered on the cliff of the Nimi Hill facing the two rivers. Uh, Qi and Dadu. Uh, so, on the way to uh, Living Hill, I ask you a question. Why the people were built, they built border in the Tang Dynasty? Can you tell me why? Yeah, please. Yes, good. You see, uh, here is the three rivers converging. Uh, if the rainy heavy, the rivers were flooding, were flooding. Then, you see, if the big water wash his uh, feet, his instep, then the river will come to into the city. So the laws and local people don't like the big, uh, big water wash his feet. So it's a dirty, <laughs> it's a dirty feet. And after liberation, uh, the 
was uh, wash uh, terms. terms. So it's a terror. The staff of the big border can sit more than 100 people. It's in staff at the same time. First of all, uh, I will give you some souvenirs. Only touch three, but big three. Lambu is, uh, is a very good, uh, famous uh, tree in China. Put away for furniture, quite strong. Mm. So called Lambu, Lambu, same pronunciation. Hey, no, hey, 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 This is one of the many temples so above the giant Buddha. If you learn something from Fu Xian and Wen Su, and this statue, this is a uh, uh, Sakya Moni. Uh, all the statues uh, broken during the Heart of the Revolution. Uh, okay, no photos, please. Uh, you see, after, let me see, uh, 16th century. Yeah. 15th century Buddha. They touch his belly button for luck. We're now walking towards this the top. This is the track down there uh, to Big Buddha. And there is the head of Big Buddha. And panning down way below is the river. Some of our party decided to climb down. We stayed on top to watch them. There's the track down, steep and slippery. Look at that water moving so rapidly past the foot of Big Buddha. One can readily anticipate that probably fishermen would be in and water like that. And from the other side, looking down from Big Buddha's head, there is the track down once again. And at its foot, the people gather, but on top we saw more of the temples and the peace and quiet and tranquility that these temples offer. It's really beautiful. Back to the bus and to our hotel. And next morning a wonderful experience. Raining, of course, which is often the case in this part of the world. But we visited a kindergarten. A truly wonderful kindergarten. Here are the kiddies gathered and now they're putting on a show for us. Aren't they beautiful?
get look at that. The teacher was really wonderful with them. And out in the playground, look at the imaginative playground toys the kiddies have. So sad that it was raining we couldn't see them using them. Leaving one class, they were sad to see us go. One of our members was the next high school teacher, Kayama High School, and he was very keen to see education in China. They invited us to have the traditional Chinese green tea, Lashan Jasmine Tea. And here is ex Kaima High School principal Bruce Lemphy, really enjoying his. Rain, rain, more rain, quite heavy rain. But it made the rooftops around the school look even more interesting. Where in the classroom, the kidneys were putting on a little show for us. And they were sad to see us going. Aren't they delightful? Down in the playground, still raining. And sadly, we go to look at more of the sites of Lashan. The people seem to be happily paddling around the wet streets. Soldiers on a truck, and there's a little taxi, three wheel taxi. <laughs> Past the hotel. We are now heading to Mount Omai, the sacred Mount Omai, but sadly we couldn't get there. The heavy rains, a little heavier than usual, had washed out the road completely. So please turn your, turn to your left side. The mountain. Oh, 
so we we stop here and landed back because this is as far as we could go and we could see the rapidly flowing river below us indicating just how heavy the rainfall had been We stopped for lunch at a mountain hotel where at Chiang Kai-shek had lived there during the long march. We were of course at Chichuan and that is the centre of the spicy food in China. We had an excellent lunch. Goodness knows what we were eating, but it all tasted good. And the beer was good too. Every meal produces beer. It's quite a feature of dining in China. After lunch, we head out to look at a temple nearby. Over a bridge near a rapidly flowing stream. Still raining a bit. And here is the temple ahead of us, in the mist. They offered us a sedan chair ride up the hill, but we felt we could climb the steps and get there ourselves. There were, of course, the inevitable stalls, selling souvenirs. But up above, it was the temple itself. Oh, 
This is the feature of the temple. Look at the fine carving on it. I guess the reef above it. Look at the carving, really something. Tremendous workmanship. Again, wonderful roofscapes. Even in the mist and rain, it looked wonderful. A magnificent artistry. There is the sedan chair. But again, we felt we could get down on our own. Back to the coach, where we found the inevitable vendors, of course. And on to another temple. Here the monks were more in evidence than on the previous one. I didn't work out the significance of the bells, but uh, clearly they represented a time to pray or something related to the frequency of prayer. Like most of the temples, you climb up and up and up to the more superior or more sacred or more supreme temples, the further one goes up the hill. I guess it means the closer to heaven, the better it is.
very steep steps. Other is one to occupy Through a moon gate. Wonderful gardens. Fascinating decorations everywhere. There are some monks. The gate to the sacred Mount Amai, the stairway to heaven, from the star. And so we say farewell to Mount Omai and head back into the Shan proper past because the hotel. In the summer, and back the big shed uh, feel quite cool. No, the banyan tree. How much for riding a pity can? Usually from here to the Omai. That would be 10, 10 yuan. 10 yuan is about two and a half dollars. It's a pedicab. Broken down by the look of it. Very badly broken road on the way to the railway station. Okay, here are uh, this uh, train station. Uh, a very elegant waiting room as we waited our train north to Chengdu. We were, of course, the honored tourists to have access to this waiting room. And we were, of course, traveling a better class than the other passengers. This was a special tourist train coming from the south. The big thing about trains in China, they run precisely on time, they arrive on time, they leave on time, they run to time, always. Mostly old English supplied or German supplied rolling stock. Mostly diesel hauled now, but uh, many of the trains still use steam locomotives because there was a lot of coal in China. Close by the rail station of course every bit of space is used for agriculture. And here comes the train. Right on time. There was a very long train, but finally it stopped and we found our carriage and away we went. We had book seats, thank goodness. Away we go. And this was going to be one of the most interesting rail journeys one could ever make. To see how the heartland of agricultural China works. The rail trip north to Chengdu was about 90 kilometers. 
and took about two hours. Quite fast, very reliable, comfortable. The rail track is all laid on concrete sleepers and is very even, as you can see from the steadiness of these photographs. Everywhere, agriculture. Dukes of straw from the hay they've just harvested. Ducks, planting new rice of course. That's the wall of a commune. Inside the wall, the whole of the agricultural process is controlled within the one community. Often many thousands of people are involved. There they are ploughing, ready for the next crop to go in. And of course the iniquitous buffalo everywhere. It's tractor, family vehicle, food. It goes through the whole gamut of life in China. So many different crops in the one area. Ducks, of course, everywhere. This is a rural village. Quite good housing. The farmer is now quite wealthy because he can sell some of his crop outside the government control system and gets quite good money for it. This he mostly puts back into his home or buying the essential consumer goods. The acquisition of a bicycle comes first, then a tractor, then maybe television and a refrigerator. That is almost the ultimate achievement. standard of housing on the farm is often very much superior to that in the city. The city dwellers now see the farmer as the wealthy people in their community.
bypass the train in one of the sidings and we're on our way again. Our people are now tired and resting. Quite a comfortable train. Rapidly flowing rivers. But again, every bit of space is used for drying straw and of course grain. There they are threshing grain by hand. Everywhere one looks, there is activity. More grain being threshed. It's almost the typical bring the harvesting scene that one imagines as being so much a vital part of life in China. And it was happening everywhere. Everywhere one looked, there were people busily bringing the harvest in. Every now and again we would pass through a more crowded path and the occasional wall commune but mostly it was open land with lots of people working hard. The train could pick up speed because the track was almost straight all the way and it was quite flat. The immensity of the land and the extent of the intense cultivation was quite astounding. And yet, everywhere it was beautiful to look at. I gather this is typical overcast weather, but I should imagine on a nice, sunny, bright day, this scene would be truly something to see. With 1.2 billion mouths to feed in China, one can see how vital the work of the people on the land is to sustain the people of this huge country. close to Chengdu, as we waited for a train to pass by, we were able to see the typical operation of a family group who are there winnowing rice using a hand-driven winnowing or threshing machine. The, the stalks and all the 
all the undesirable parts of the grain, of course, are removed by this winnowing. And then the grain is picked up again and put through the, uh, the hand-driven device to finally reduce it as much as possible to clean, separated grain. Of course, I guess uh, there's still a little bit of uh, dirt and other things amongst it. They seem to have no uh, concern about walking through the, uh, through the grain they're producing. But I guess it's a wash when they cook it. And it's t t time to go. Next morning in Chengdu, it was another wet and foggy day. On the way, this is a very beautiful temple in Chengdu, where Amongst other things, are the famous steels of China, where the history is recorded, engraved on solid rock. And uh, this is the official corridor, and uh, that one is the general corridor. Now let's go this way. I have water. I know. These are past emperors. Shown in effigy. This is the black one. This is the black one. Chinese emperor, which means he is a straightforward guy and very truthful.
Dubai. 161 to 223. Still raining. You can see why gold is so revered in China. The emperor certainly had it. This is Zhu Xian, who lived until the year 263. They said there is some doubt whether the emperor was actually buried there, but it was still celebrated as the burial spot. <laughs> Final stop was the mausoleum of the Emperor Yubei. We are now going back to the coach. Beautiful water gardens and trees everywhere. Uh, yeah, the government uh, has taken some measures to rebuild these old houses. Uh, at the same time, some old houses are preserved. Yeah, you're not stronger. Yeah? And uh, these preserved old houses can satisfy such a feeling of ours. So in the modern city of Chengdu, we still can, can see the old side of Chengdu. Not only the modern side. <laughs> this is some of the old town of Chengdu. And of course, the inevitable tourist trap where we saw some superb craftsmanship. producing pandas on fine silk on the previous picture. They're now doing weaving in other colours, floral display in this one. It's 
silk thread on fine silk background. Beautiful work. Very intense work. Need very keen eyesight and therefore young people. The working life in this sort of work is said to be usually no more than 8 or 12 years before they can no longer see the work and do it well. There's a typical panda on silk screen. Eating his bamboo shoots. All of this work is of course for sale. And the prices are quite reasonable when one thinks how much of a person's working life goes into producing them. There was no electricity that day, so the lighting was very poor to take good photographs of these works indoors. Apparently, failure in the electricity supply is a fairly normal part of life in this part of the world where there's just not enough power to go around. Everything is done by hand in the factory, so I guess at least if the electricity supply fails, they can still keep working. Driving on through Chengdu. Under his leadership, the Chinese people have done many good things, but uh, really also many foolish things. Uh, this uh, self sufficient handicraft industry, industries uh, have been, had collapsed uh, gradually. Yeah, collapsed gradually. And so these streets, many streets have changed their sides, have changed their sides. Yeah, here is the ship market street. The ship market street. This is the old town. All the bicycles parked outside the cinema. More bicycles for sale. Tailors, all sorts of shops. Uh, the ancient city of Chengdu. That's the north gate of the old walled city of Chengdu. And the shops go on and on and on. This is still part of the old city that dates back to the days of Marco Polo, when it was the ancient capital of China.
These shopping streets go just on and on forever. The rain is now starting to diminish and the day improving a little. Here we are at a, another factory, of course, where they are making bamboo ware. Here they are shredding the bamboo down to extremely fine strips for weaving, as you'll see later. Here they are stranding them down even further very fine strips of bamboo for tying, virtually as thread. And here are the girls working, covering china bottles and teapots and whatever with a fine film of bamboo to provide bamboo design on the outside of them. Very effective work. Produced some truly artistic results. Again, it needs good eyesight and fine, intricate work, and mostly young people. Again, the lifespan when they can continue to do this quality of work is quite minimal. But she's happy in her work. Because it's now lunchtime. And of course they eat on the spot. But that gives us a good chance to admire some of the fine work they're doing. Their lunchtime is staggered and while some eat, others proceed with their work. Here they're weaving a mat of bamboo. They work hard and for long hours for very minimal pay. Here's an apprentice learning how to do it, being taught by one of the more experienced people. And of course, the inevitable shock. Beautiful work, but of course, like all things, when one is travelling fast and hard, you just cannot carry them, even if you did want them. We did, of course, bring back a few little bits and pieces of souvenirs, but uh, not very much from this shop. Why are panda getting less and lesser? There are three reasons for it. Uh, the first reason uh, is because the panda is very gentle. It's very gentle. We're going to the zoo now. To protect themselves against uh, white, uh, white bears animals attack. Yeah. And uh, when it's a tiger, a bear, uh, I think uh, it's not easy for them to run away. 
The zoo was a little bit disappointing because it was late in the day and being a nocturnal animal the pandas were of course asleep. That's the closest we could see of the panda. Later on in Beijing we get a better look at something and here's a brief clip from Beijing which you'll see more fully in a later film. The panda there was wide awake and very photogenic. As you can see, a bit of an exhibitionist too. Just look at that. Sitting back and grooming itself ready to go to sleep. Picking his toenails. But back at Chengdu, although the the giant panda was asleep and we couldn't see it in action. The lesser panda was there. Really? This is the male and female oh. pair wandering around their moated enclosure. Look a little bit like raccoons. The males don't follow females, they've got it all wrong. <laughs> Have I? <laughs> That's what I said she may be a husband, don't they? Not quite as attractive a creature as the uh, giant panda, but uh, Good to see, just the same. Look at that. They've learnt where food comes from. But having left there, we come back to course, the inevitable shop at the zoo where again they're having a meal, although this is quite late in the day. But uh, I guess uh, they have to sustain themselves fairly regularly as their diet is not ideal. We're now trying to get through a gate where a picture show is just coming out. We're now having a late lunch and again the spicy Sichuan food was really good as was the Chengdu beer another fine German style lager our last Sichuan meal we're about to catch the plane from Chengdu to Xi'an Beautiful, spicy Chinese food. Wonderful As we leave, again, the one child with Grandpa. And look at the escape hatch in the pants. But before we leave, we go to 
a truly superb exhibition of art at the Chengdu Centre of Arts. This is the famous artist about to give us a demonstration, the director of the institute. He has exhibited abroad and been very successful. Some of the work is clearly pot boiler work, but much of it is quite superb. And here he is about to demonstrate how he does it. It's really well done. Careful colour mixing and finesse of his brush strokes produced a quite remarkable result.
It is beautiful work. It's a great tribute to his craftsmanship. This is the piece de resistance now, as he puts the bamboo into the picture. And in a moment you'll see the puzzle sort of come alive. And the pan in two styles. The pan in two styles. This is a shape. The shape point. Now, what's he putting there? Watch it carefully. <coughs> Look at him mixing his colours with what appears to be sort of wild abandon, but the results are quite astonishing. Look at the delicacy of the brush stroke there. It's such a coarse brush. Quite remarkable work, really. Just look at the range of colours from the one brush stroke there. Quite remarkable. And again. The picture is now coming alive. Have you worked out what it is yet?
And now, of course, he is signing it. This is most important because this is the outer signature and also a certification from the Institute of Chengdu, which attests to its authenticity and also to its value. The quality of the calligraphy he is doing from that what appears to be quite coarse brush is, is truly astonishing. He can produce the thick or thin strokes pretty much as needed. And totally confident, no pause, he just proceeds almost as though he's using a pencil. And now the seal of authenticity. And there it is. And the further seal in the other corner completes the authentication of this painting. Oh, beautiful. Again, we survey all of his work around the room. Lots of pandas, of course. They sell. And look at that one. To purchase, of course. Inevitably, we to come and bring two of the paintings back to Sydney with us. Here they are. They are quite beautiful, really. The delicacy of the artwork is something to behold. Again, on the other one, really superb work. It really captures Mount Amai, which is the fix. We're now at the airport. As our Yak 7, Chinese built, Russian designed, rather ancient airplane arrived to take us way north to Xi'an. 